Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Tarek. For those who were not here yesterday, just to uh, relocalize uh, this amazing uh, work that Tarek El Aris is doing, uh, I have been for sure uh, fascinated by history for, I mean, for many years. And just to try to, because we've been talking a lot about language, and uh, language for many thinkers is the, the perfect paradigm of virtuality. I've been trying to like dig uh, a genealogy of the of the language, going think, trying to think at least guessing uh, until pre proto language, into the darkness of pre 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 proto language, and we came out with many friends, um, uh, historian hackers, uh, on the fact that this completely unknown. Uh, space-time where we come from is probably what we fear the most in terms of when we are trying to understand what is the coming up future that we will face with the rise of technology. Eric Sadin, who will be with us later, says something very interesting about, about artificial intelligence. He says that in the end of the day, artificial intelligence uh, will not, like in the Hollywoodian uh, narrative, fight the mankind in these very cliche uh, battles between the robots and the humans that we sometimes enjoy at 2, uh, two a.m. in the night when you're back home from a, from a walk. It's just moving forward from us. It's just like leaving us. It's too speed, it's too fast. If you get alone in a single room with a genius, or if you have four people with a genius, it's highly possible that the four people will not last with this genius. What I'm trying to understand here is that uh, the question that we have to, to, to just like concretize at some point about the virtuality before to think how to counter, how countering this virtuality is what is virtuality? What does it mean really? Is everything virtual? So the first thing I wanted to do was to invite a second person that now I'm inviting, Youssef Merhi, who is both by different aspects, targeting this question as a hacker, as a poet, as a teacher, as an artist. Can you please, Youssef, come with us? Hi, Youssef. Hello. Yeah, amazing to have you here. I'm not going to talk that much tonight. Youssef, what is a hacker, basically? <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's a very good question. And <laughs> this is a hacker, basically. Um, so we were born as hackers in the sense that we are trying to understand what reality is to depict, to have um, some sort of idea of where we are. What are we doing here? Um, where do we come from? Where are we going? And this is uh, mostly philosophical questions. This is what, what you ask yourself when you study philosophy. Um, but being a hacker and being a philosopher uh, usually don't match. I mean, we, we, we usually don't think um, on philosophers as hackers. However, um, if, we, if we trace the history of philosophy, um, we will find out that philosophy um, was the, the foundation of all knowledge. Um, it's, it's the place where science uh, came from. Yeah chemistry, physics, music. Um, and one of the quests of philosophy was trying to access uh, a level of knowledge that seems to be hidden. So um, there are different meanings for the word hacker. Um, and some of these meanings um, refer to some common knowledge that we know. Um, the first person that I'm depicting here uh, is Kevin Mitnick. He was 
the most notorious hacker during the 90s. Um, and he basically gave himself to, to the intelligence in the US. Um, so a hacker can be a very skilled person in the field of computer. Um, but that not, not, not necessarily applies to all the different possibilities of what a hacker could be. Um, a hacker may be also a clever solver problem. Uh, someone who tries to find a solution, to find um, a way of solving any, any problem. Um, and that could be uh, established using any, any tool. Um, it doesn't have necessarily to be a computer. Um, but then we have also um, hackers that usually think in the opposite way or in a way that some people didn't think about. This is called reverse engineering. And reverse engineering is uh, taking an object, um, usually we think about computers, and make it function in a way that wasn't meant to function. Um, so by these meanings, um, we could have uh, an idea of what a hacker is. And this, as I said, could be applied to any field. Could be applied to computers, uh, video games, robotics, music, um, and especially, very especially, our bodies. Um, the concept, the, the most common concept that we have about hackers is being a spy um, or being a burglar, a vandal. Um, but interestingly, this concept has changed. And uh, now we don't see the vandal, but we see the hero. And this is how Anonymous uh, portrays themselves. The concept of hacking, um, if, we, if we follow uh, the academic concept, started at MIT um, back in the 60s. And those were uh, mostly computer scientists uh, that were working in a lab. Um, but the, the notion of hacking at that moment wasn't at all about um, spying or, uh, you know, vandalizing. Um, on the contrary, it was about uh, creating works. It was about creating something in a very high intensity level. And that's also very important uh, for us to understand what a hacker means. Um, someone who could delight others on a campus. So a hack is some, something that will surprise you, that will amaze you, uh, that will somehow shake you and feel that uh, something happened. just like a magician. Um, and here we have um, someone who, who defines himself as a um, white hat hacker. Um, so this is like a good hacker, a white hat hacker. Um, his name is Pablos Holman. And Pablo said that hackers have a mind that's optimized for discovery. They have a mind that's optimized for figuring out what's possible. So now we are thinking about hackers on those that could make the impossible possible, who can bypass the limits of what has been said. Um, and finally, we, in this sense, we have um, these individuals, um, this is on the left side, Hugh Herr, and on the right side, uh, Wim Hof. Um, both of them are athletes. Um, Hugh lost his legs 
uh, while climbing, there was um, a storm, a very strong storm, a blizzard, and he built his legs. He went uh, into studying engineering and he rebuilt his legs. And the interesting thing is that those new legs became more precise. He became like a, a bionic man in that sense. And uh, Wim Hof uh, has obtained 26 world records. And this is a man that has defeated what science has told that it's impossible. Um, just by breathing, and this is a very old technique, it's called Kriya. Um, so these are just two examples. This is something um, that relates to what I've been doing. Um, as you remember, this is at La Colonie, but it has been exhibited in different places. And what we are looking at is an installation uh, comprised by the emails of Hugo Chavez, the late and former president of Venezuela. And these emails were inter intercepted for six years, between 1998 and 2004. Um, yes, I, I was it. responsible of intercepting these emails. Um, of course, when I did it, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do with this information. I wasn't aware of how long it will take me to um, create this archive uh, that has been presented in 1,000 square feet it, or uh, one kilometer of data. Um, and what you, what you are looking at is the history, the unknown history of Venezuela, Latin America, and the world. Uh, and you become not only an spectator, but um, you become a participant because you start creating your own path while you read these emails. And these emails were sent by regular people like us or uh, very well-known politicians, uh, people from the army, from different um, governments. Um, and this is an example of one of the, the works that I've been doing. There are many different works that um, deal with hacking in many different ways. Um, but I think this is um, one of the probably uh, most um, touching. So just by knowing that these are the emails of Chavez makes you think, well, how did you get it, right? What happened? How, how it's possible that I'm still here talking to you um, and not in prison or dead? Um, and I want to, to also show how, um, by revealing these emails, I want people to know the truth about themselves. This is, um, well, I, I, there are some elements, some patterns that repeat themselves uh, throughout the history. And these patterns are usually related to some uh, psychological motifs. When you read some of these emails, you find out the naiveness of people. Um, the fact that they gave power to someone that came from the army who uh, did two uh, coup d'etats prior to becoming a president um, tells you a lot about our relationship with politics. And this is a plan that was created years before we learned about the existence of Chavez. It's not something that happened from one day to the next one. It's not because people were only tired of having corruption and politicians uh, telling lies all the time. But uh, this is a, a master plan that has been implemented uh, basically to reshape our geopolitical map. Um, and while I'm saying this, this is happening on real time. 
as you know, um, yesterday, Maduro took over the power just because he said so for the next six years. And there weren't elections. No one said, I didn't vote. No one voted. So this is the, the kind of model, the fascist model, that we are living nowadays. So you think that, I mean, I'm thinking about another work you did, which is also very important in terms of countering the virtual dispossession. I think you also hacked the whole uh, police identities in Venezuela, no? Yes, Can so that's... Tell us so this uh, wall that you are looking at right now, it's uh, 13 or 14 meters long by 4.5 meters height. And as you remember, uh, two years ago, or now three years ago, um, there was uh, a, a, a revolt in Venezuela. There have been many in the past 20 years. Um, and I, I even had a cousin who died in, in one of the first ones where almost two million people went into marching. So in the, in the last one, um, students went into the streets and they were protesting. I will show you one image of one of them. This is uh, a musician, a uh, uh, violinist. <laughs> Youssef, I was about to ask you a question when we've been a little bit hacked by another hacker, yeah. I was, uh, so in the end of the day, uh, do you think that everything is virtual? And if so, how? I definitely believe that we live in a virtual structure. Everything that is taking place in this precise moment is virtual. And I understand, I have this um, conception that everything is virtual because everything that we do within this society um, is based on a set of rules that were devised before we were born. So we, when, we, when we get here, um, we already have an identity. We have a religion, we have a name. <laughs> I mean, excuse me to interrupt you, but you know when we've been hacked, you were talking about this hack of the uh, digital annuary of the police in Venezuela. We were talking Maybe about you can the finish on police. that and then you tell us about the virtual. Sorry. Sure, okay, let's. <laughs> How do you feel? I feel very strange. I feel that I was exorcised. And I was, this, this was very powerful. Um, and, and the impact is, I'm, I'm still processing what's, what's going on. <laughs> and this is why I certainly believe that this is virtual. Because any given moment, anything could happen. We don't know it. And the fact that we don't know it, um, is based on the illusion. I mean, the, the, the Vedic scriptures uh, talk about Maya. And this notion of Maya, of illusion, has been portrayed on every single creative form. This is Maya. Maybe we are. So just to finish about the police, um, what happened is that I revealed the names of 50,000 officers, his ID, their ID numbers, and some other sensitive data. 
<laughs> you should be sitting here and feel what I'm feeling now. <laughs> so this is quite serious because by doing this action, I was showing that even the police forces have no power to hide themselves. And we are constantly, and this is connected to the notion of virtual. Um, usually when we talk about virtual in the realm of computers, we talk about something that is not physical, that you cannot touch, that you cannot uh, perceive in a physical sense. But you experience it. And this experience is constantly evolving, especially now. I mean, I remember when virtual reality appeared. Um, I was uh, very, very young. And in the 90s, it was something really amazing, something that you definitely had to experience. And suddenly, boom, it vanished. There was no more virtual reality. And I know that one of the reasons was that the technology wasn't ready. We had to await almost a decade or more uh, to have the proper technology to experience virtual reality. And in the beginnings, when you had the Hamlet and you had the virtual reality experience, in less than three minutes, you started feeling a headache, a very intense headache. Um, and I think that was a sort of sign of what was going to happen. The technology is producing what we just saw or felt a few minutes ago. It's a disruption. And we are accepting this disruption. I mean, think 20 years ago, we didn't have smartphones. We didn't have uh, the internet as we have it today with this fantastic compression. Um, we didn't have the technology that we now rely on um, it's, it's becoming scary. Uh, I remember that William Gibson, a uh, uh, science fiction author, and the one that coined the word chrome on, her, on his first um, story, uh, which was published uh, uh, several decades ago, um, he said that the future generations, he said specifically our grandsons and granddaughters will know um, what computers are because they are going to be embedded within themselves. They won't know. And at the rate that we're going these days, probably they won't know, not uh, in one generation, maybe in two generations. Uh, but if you look at some um, advancements that some labs and some even major corporations are doing. I'm thinking now about a company called Magic Leap. Have you heard about Magic Leap? So this is a virtual reality system that is not on the market yet. They created a fake prototype. So you could, you know, um, have some sense of something that is really fake. Um, and basically, what Magic Leap is going to do is that the, a beam of light is going to be sent directly into your brains. There are no screens. You won't have screens. Data is going directly to the brains. And this is something that was portrayed by many sci-fi authors, movies like Johnny Mnemonic, I mean, you name it, The Matrix, you know, it's there. We're getting there. It's a matter of years. I mean, I know that it's going to happen very, very soon. And I'm, I, I think that this is going to reshape not only the notion of virtual, 
uh, but the notion of humanity. We are living in a virtual world, not because we are using virtual reality, but because the structures that we have accepted are I have different words, but the, the word that comes to me is simulacra. Um, if you think about governments, right? I mean, we, we, we take for granted that governments have to govern us. Is it so? Mm -hmm. Who said so? <laughs> Planet Earth? nature. I mean, we, we created monsters called politicians to basically suck our blood, take our consciousness away. And I'm not being radical here. I'm not being an anarchist. I'm not being on any political side, the right, the left. Seriously, I am not. But I'm just looking at this structure, and I see a simulacra. I see something that is not natural. It's absolutely unnatural. I mean, we, we know that there are some species that have some sort of governments, but not the way we, are, we have created them. Or have we created them? I mean, I, I, I have nothing to do with Maduro and, you know, these people. Uh, and he claimed himself as president. Who said so? <laughs> and then you have Sorry, the economy, you, you have the money, you have like all the different structures of society. And everything is fake. Everything is a huge fake. F fictions. Fictions. Pure fictions. So we live in a fictional world. Not because the world is a fiction. I mean, when, when I spend time in the mountains or in front of the sea, or like I, I really sense the telluric side of existence, or even when I meditate and I sit and I have no ideas, no thoughts, no words, just the breath that comes in and goes out, and I like enter into this state, I sense reality in a way that no politician can tell me, in a way that no um, even intellectual could describe. You said, hold on, this is why you say in the film, basically, that the ultimate hack is the hack of yourself, basically. Exactly. Could you please elaborate? So the, the hack that we are looking for is not what I showed you, it's not the emails of Hugo Chavez. It's not Trump. It's not, you know, the Department of Treasury or the Pentagon or you name it, whatever. Um, it's ourselves. I mean, what we are really expecting to hack is ourselves. Is, is our physical perceptive, sensorial structure in order to acquire another level of consciousness. And we usually change our consciousness by doing so many things. I mean, when, when I take this phone, I enter a virtual state and I experience adrenaline or anxiety or fear or, you know, there are so many emotions. Um, this is not what life is about. This is just an object that I can use maybe to create interesting things, um, maybe to communicate with, you know, with you or any of you. Um, but the real thing is us. 
and we have to question, what are we doing here? What are you, wh why are you sitting here? What's the purpose of listening to what I'm saying? And I'm not saying something new. I know there are many people that have asked this question to us because I'm not uh, somewhere else. I'm, I'm part of this. I'm the audience as well. And I'm the one that is thinking with you while you are thinking with me. I'm speaking. I have the microphone right now. Yes. And, um... But that not necessarily makes me more special or the fact that I'm hacking is, you know, it's, it's not more special. Um, but if you really could find the answers for yourself, then you are the hackers. How did you feel when you've been hacked by this moment before? It's abrupt, for sure. Um, I wasn't expecting this. Um, although I knew something, but I, I really didn't know when it was going to happen on, or how. Um, I, I feel that I was shaken. I'm still shaken. And I'm taking this energy, and I'm giving back to you. And probably you are shaking too. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carter. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much.